good afternoon or good morning or wherever this is finding you today. Um, my name is Pastor Nicole Eastwood. I'm here at Our Savior Lutheran Church in Vero Beach. Uh, every week, my colleague here in this call, I'm actually sitting in his office because the internet was spotty in mine. Uh, but my pastor uh, colleague, Pastor Mark Bernthal, or I, we interview or we chat ourselves about the text of the week. This week, I've co-opted Pastor Mark's office. I've co-opted the topic, and I'm inviting my friend, mentor, and colleague, Pastor Nathan Swinson Reinhold, to come and also to share this conversation with his congregation. So, Pastor Nathan, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, you've already done it. Nathan Swinson Reinhold, Lord of Life Lutheran Church in uh, Fairfax and Clifton, Virginia. We're uh, just just outside of Washington, D.C. It has been interesting up here. Um, and I don't know how political Pastor Nicole and I are going to get today, but this authority conversation is a really interesting conversation, um, especially when it comes to Christian leadership. Anyway, it's great to be with, I think, have I done this with you before for your people? I think I've yes. done it one at a time. So it's great to be back with uh, your folks down in Florida. I hope it's a little warmer down there than it is up here. It's a cold day here in uh, the mid-Atlantic. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I am in paradise. You know, when you and I worked together in Longwood, we thought we were in paradise, but apparently I've discovered paradise and it's a lot closer to A1A. And, uh, yeah, I believe that. Pretty great. I believe that. I you know, believe pick that. up the kids from school. God, don't you just want to go for a walk on the beach? Okay. Well, I so, but people who aren't from Florida aren't really going to understand that when you live in Florida and you've got six to seven months of just beautiful weather, yes, it's five months of summer, but but the winter makes up for it is mm. just in general. I mean, occasionally every 40 years you get the snow and you get the frost and, but, but who cares, right? When the rest of it is just absolutely gorgeous. So when I show up, let me find it, let me find it real quick. We worked together in Longwood for uh, five years together. And uh, let's see what he's got here. So when I took the call at uh, at St. Stephen in Longwood, I show up and this is hanging on my doorknob in 2008. And so I still, it's mounted over my door here. <laughs> <laughs> but the paradise part worked just a little bit better when I was in Florida. So anyway. Uh, yeah, I have a similar sign. It's out on the deck by my pool where the palm trees are and all sorts of other good things. Yeah, but, yeah exactly. Well, today we're going to take a trip uh, across the ocean to a different land of palm trees um, to actually a really rich, beautiful part of Israel, um, Palestine, the Sea of Galilee area. Uh, Jesus is beginning his ministry. We are still uh, both of our, our contexts use the Revised Common Lectionary, I believe. And so we are in Mark chapter one. The Gospel of Mark is crazy. It moves so fast. We have heard uh, about John the Baptist. We've heard Jesus baptized. We've heard Jesus tempted in the wilderness. We've heard him go to Galilee, call some disciples. Now we're going to see him teaching and healing. And we haven't, and we're only like two thirds of the way through the first chapter. That's right. Uh, so yeah. Mark's gospel is really fun, I think, in that way that we get a lot of stuff uh, in a little bit of time. So we're going to go now. We are in Galilee, northern part of the land, um, the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, which is a more Greek name, or Lake Gennesaret, Gennes whatever, Gennesaret. I, I probably got that wrong. That's the Hebrew name. Gennesaret. So sometimes... Our, our scriptures are going to give us the same name for the three different names for the same place. Um, yeah, exactly. But here, because Mark is really focusing on the ministry happening in uh, the region of Galilee, we're going to see um, the Sea of Galilee. So, Pastor Reverend Dr. Nathan, hmm. Swinson Reinhold. Okay, so here are verses Please. 21 to 28. And I'm reading just so um, our folks at home know, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, not the NRSV. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus cut him short. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. And at that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It is such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. So yeah. this, this is such an interesting text. We really see, you know, if you want to look at the literary, we see it beginning with teaching and authority. We see it ending with authority. And so you can almost picture uh, like it's pointing in that that this, this healing of the demon or the casting out of the demon is a central point to this authority. And that's what we're really dealing with here, um, which is why I wanted to have this conversation with you, Pastor Nathan. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. I have not really told you why I've called you here today. No, you um, haven't. I'm, I'm really, I'm peaked now. What, yeah. What's so the bait and switch here, Rev? There's two reasons. Um, one of them, because we share uh, a relationship with a similar uh, mentor, or at least experience of one with with someone who had great authority, and so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the first one is because you had me read a book early on in um, in our time together. I was not an ordained pastor. You know exactly where I'm going, don't you? Um, in our time together, I was a lay uh, leader in the church. I was a staff person. I worked full time with uh, Pastor Nathan. Uh, and part of that was a discernment to ministry. And one of the books that he had me read was The Servant by James C. Hunter. Yeah, that's the one. And and the ser the servant is a great story. Um, I looked. I don't have it on my bookshelf. I've got it. Let me find it. Um, I lost. Must have lost it in the move. It's a great story that. Um, it tells the story of a man kind of having a midlife crisis and he starts to discover what's important and he really settles on servant leadership and we encounter this differentiation between early on in this book that's the one a simple story about the true essence of leadership it says by james c hunter and we discover this difference between power and authority mm -hmm. And that has resonated with me all these years. And I know it resonated with you. That's why you had uh, a number of us read this book. Um, do you want to give away the breakdown of the difference in power and authority? Well, the way James C. Hunter breaks it down is power and the way that he uses that. Power is the ability and leadership to coercively get people to do what you want them to do. So... It's, it's for us like pastorally, like people should do what we, we want them to do because we have a collar. That's a power posture. Take it off. <laughs> it, versus an authority posture, which is leader, the ground of leadership, the foundation of leadership is, is born of our own love and sacrifice for people. Yeah, he talks about it with power coming with the position. Yep. Um, but authority is not dependent upon your position in an organization no. uh, or in a family or anything like that. And no. so I remember, as I recall, there was a, um, an illustration in the book or that I somehow took out of that, thinking of the, the janitor or the custodian who knows all of the names of the children at school yeah. and who is so well respected and has so much authority, though yeah. no power based upon the position yep. that he has. Yep. And that I think is really illustrated in our gospel for this week, because Jesus is not coming as a position of authority or, or as a position of power. No, um, he, and, if, you, if you wanted to, you could assert he was ordained by God in, in the Jordan, right? But, but especially in the gospel of Mark, the only person who sees, hears, experiences that is Jesus himself. It's really clear, nobody else can see what's happening to Jesus in that particular moment. So you're right. He's showing up in these particular instances and he doesn't have the right initials after his name. He's not ordained. He doesn't have any of that credibility. And, and teaching in, in the temple or excuse me, in the synagogue would have yeah. been something that was available to any adult Jewish male. Yeah. However, uh, just like it kind of is in our 
I mean, technically the baptized are able to do uh, all of that kind of stuff, but just like in our, you know, culture of our congregation, that's typically something that falls to you or I, or another, yeah. we have a deacon in my congregation. You have a deacon in your congregation. They're also yeah. called to proclaim the word formally. Yeah. Um, but, and so in the same way in the synagogues, that teaching would have been a function of, of the rabbis or the scribes. Yeah. Um, but, or you could be invited, but Jesus is not waiting for the in invitation. No, no, he's standing up. And I, I think I, I like the direction you're pushing this because we even hear it between preachers in our own traditions or other Christian traditions. There are people that are able to stand up and embody the gospel in ways that others don't. Some people always feel like they're fumbling around with the faith, even when they've got collars. And by the way, for um, for you folks down there in Vero Beach and for my folks here or abroad, she's wearing a collar, but, but Pastor Nicole Eastwood knows the difference between power and authority, and she knows where it comes from. And for those who know her and love her, they love her because of her service and sacrifice. She is a true servant leader, not because she has a collar on, but because it's hard won. It's a character grounding. So Jesus is standing up. No, I'm just going to give that. And, and it's, it's apparent in her preaching as well. I know this. I got to hear her preach before she strapped on the collar. And it's even more profound now. But there's a difference in preachers who, um, who preach with authority. And, and I, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But for me, that comes down to a a theologian and a teacher who is so absorbed the reality of the gospel into their system, it drips out of their pores when they start speaking about it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, this last year, so I, for your folks who don't know, um, I was ordained in uh, September of 2019, began my call here in the middle of October, 2019, which means I had five whole months uh, yeah. <laughs> face to face with these folks. And I'm also in a team context like you are. So I'm not even preaching every week. I have five whole months. So let's say 15, may, maybe no, 15 sermons. Uh, yeah. opportunities to be it, it, with folks in that way before COVID, you know, shut everything down. And so yeah. now the majority of my time has been spent like that. And what's amazed me over the past year and what has been really made firm is just the importance of trust, being trustworthy and building trust, uh, which is obviously a, a huge part of James C. Hunter's servant as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is not as hard. <laughs> I, I, it is. It is hard. It, 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 it's got to be partnered with integrity and all of that. And you have to say what you mean and you have to ask for forgiveness when you're wrong. Uh, and you have to do what you say you're going to do and all those sorts of things. But um, I love where I am and what's happening here. And, and it's incredible that, that they, I've been able to trust the members of this congregation and they're able to trust me. And we're in a really great mutual space. Um, and I know that that's something that you as a leader are able to do wherever God calls you to, that um, you're able to have those hard conversations when it's necessary, but you don't bring them out of the blue either. Uh, you and I've had hard conversations together where we're both like, oh, I know what you're going to say. I'm still apologizing for some of those hard conversations. <laughs> but, but, those are, but those are good things. And, the, and, and, and as you talked about, preachers with authority as we think of them today it's those who as you mentioned ooze the gospel and embody it and live it and feel it but they also understand their context and their people and the heart of their people and 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 seek in their preaching to find where those two meet and where the challenge is and where the affirmation is um but i couldn't help in reading this Go ahead. You look like you're going to say something. No, I just, well, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I want to wonder with you out loud with that, because I think there's one other dimension of this that needs to come out. And that is, you know, what is the role of authenticity? Um, be, because when I think about people who preach and speak, speak and teach with authority, what gives them authority with me isn't their perfection. It's, it's that, um, 
their preaching and their teaching, their servant leadership is born of their hard knocks and their wounds and their struggles um, and their own inability to get certain things right, right? That's part of what gives them credibility. And I, I know that our audiences will have struggle with the idea of Jesus being imperfect, and I don't want to even go there. That's However, exactly what, man, it's like you got in my brain. Well, it's, like, it's like we spent time together or something. Um, <laughs> but that said, Jesus is preaching from who he is authentically. He's teaching from who he is authentically. This isn't stuff that he just learned in the, in the book. We can all read the book. And we can all recite the book if we learn the book well enough. It's a different thing when you've taken the content of the book or books, as I like to say. This isn't a book. It's a library. It's a holy right. library. Um, if you take the contents of the library and make them a part of yourself in a way that's alive, then it has authority. Because Which brings me to my second reason for bringing yeah. you on here today. Uh, when we served together in Longwood, uh, we had a number of retired pastors that were a member of that congregation. And uh, a mutual, uh, just a saint of the congregation who is still alive today, I believe he is now 92. Uh, but I think he's 95. Oh, 90, my word. 95. I'm pretty sure that he... He had, did have a big birthday last year, didn't he? Yeah, I'm, I think he turned 90 when I was in Longwood. You may be right. Yeah, I think he's in his mid 90s. And he and his wife are still alive, still married. <laughs> I mean, I think he what? I think he's I think he's past his 70th ordination date or something like that. That I we'll remember I was there that. for that. I was there for the 70. Yes, yeah, so it's got to be 95. An absolute saint of the of the church, um Pastor Johann Berg and his wife Anita, also a saint of the church. Just wonderful human beings yeah. and um after you left and uh, God called you up there to Virginia, where it's not quite as warm as <laughs> your sweatshirt, but the people are still good and the call of God is still real. Right, so right. Um, after you left, I took over teaching that Wednesday night Bible study that um, you had taught for so long. And I was now a seminarian and I was going through my own kind of identity crisis, kind of figuring out what my, my role was changing. My identity was changing. Yeah. Um, and you know, we had some other great colleagues that we worked with and I was trying to be all of you guys. And in the meantime, I was forgetting to be who I was. Um, and so sometimes I would put together these Bible studies and Nathan, let me tell you, I am reaching for these <laughs> facts that nobody's ever heard before something that's going to blow their mind. And I would get whiteboards and I would have so many notes and I, I got an A plus for trying really hard. <laughs> and sometimes I had over-researched so that I didn't even have a main point. And, and, and everybody was so kind and gentle and gracious. And like, well, we love you, Nicole. We don't know what you just said. Um, but then Afterwards, Pastor Berg would sometimes say, may I, may I just say something? And, and one, the fact that he respected that this was my classroom and that this yeah. was my teaching opportunity was just a huge gift um, and a support of me and the authority that I had in that group with the power position kind of thing that I was trying to figure out how to grow into. Yeah. Um, and then he would stand up and you got to picture Pastor Berg is well over six feet tall. Yeah. And it would, at, in his nineties, it took some effort with his cane mm -hmm. to get, but he always stood mm -hmm. and he would stand to speak. And then he would just talk about the love of God. Yeah. And he would talk about the love and, and it was not because he'd been ordained by God to be a pastor for 70 years. No, 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 it, no. It, it was not it. because he would taught more Bible studies than yeah. I'd been alive for. Yeah, no. It's because he loved God and knew God's love so much that yeah. it oozed from him. Yeah. And because he knew the context of those people that he let that. And I know that you and I both have spent time in their, uh, in their home and just trying to soak up his grace and his wisdom. I, and my, my seminal experience was when Aaron and I went up there and I preached, um, 
preached as part of the interview process. Um, afterwards, they stayed late, he and Anita, to talk to Aaron and I. And um, he leaned in and he said, I hope we can have a good relationship. He said, I promise not to mess around in your kitchen um, or something to that effect. But he said, I need you to know where I am theologically. And I'm like, okay. And I'm you know, excited. I don't know what's going to come out of his mouth, but I love having these kinds of conversations, especially with these retired guys. You know, they, he's like, he leans in the way, the way Johan does. And he says to me, I have a heresy, heresy. And I'm like, oh, I like heresies. I'm pretty sure we're all getting in. And I just said, I think we're going to get along just fine. We're not going to have any problems. I believe that the, I believe God's heart is that big too. And uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's a th that you say, exactly. He doesn't get up and wow us with facts. <laughs> he, he, no, it just so everybody understands out there how hard it is to lead Bible studies when you're still learning this stuff and to grow your own sense of credibility and stuff. Like we all go there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I am taking, I am now going to be egotistical enough to take credit for aligning myself with the scribes. <laughs> <laughs> well, which I, are the, the antithesis of this whole scripture. But. I, but I think that that's, we see this fight still in the church. Um, um, should we be following people because of how much stuff they know? Hmm. Um, or should we, I'm, I'm reading through Proverbs right now, and even, even in Proverbs, there is this distinction between wisdom and knowledge. Jesus had all the knowledge too, but the reason he was worth listening to was the wisdom. It was the embodied way that he carried the truth of God in him, right? Mm -hmm. So he stands up and people are going to listen because of that. And when you start talking about Pastor Berg, I mean, the reason everybody shut up and listened to him when he stood up with his cane and started to speak and still do, because, you know, he's still alive and still, I'm sure, teaching and preaching. Uh, I think he actually is uh, still doing Sunday school through Zoom. It, <laughs> it would not surprise me. But the reason that we listen to him was because of that embodied authority that didn't come from facts and figures. It came from the way that he embodied his deep, deeply held belief that the gospel is fundamentally that God is agape, unconditional love. And if he's out there listening to this, I, I hope that he feels affirmed like I heard him. I, I am going Great. to send him this uh, with with our, our yeah. blessing. Um, he just talked about God's love like this. I remember him talking about it like a river that just just flows uh, and you just get caught up in it. Yeah. Um, and, and I do think you're right. Jesus did know everything. And I think that that's actually we can we would be remiss if we did not shout out to Mary and Joseph his parents who we see in the other gospels bringing him to the temple and going to celebrate Passover. And, and we cannot forget the role that parents play in faith development is so critical. Yeah. Um, it's really, really critical. And, um, yeah. And, and I think that that's even harder right now with everything that all of the roles that parents are asked to take on. I understand in your context, I believe you guys are still, uh, your folks are, are, are teaching. Are you still all homeschool or like we're all, yeah, we're all online. Yeah. Yeah, That's, we were supposed to be back in by now, but it looks like maybe the beginning beginning of March. Yeah, and, and that's not necessarily the case here. There's a little right. bit more choice that people are making different choices, but um, yeah, it's yeah, it's just hard, and and yet part of who Jesus is is someone who was raised in their faithful Jewish household. Yeah, uh, and he knows those things, but then he also is embodying them. Yeah, uh, and and so. We see this scripture today, you know, he, the other thing that, that comes in this, I, I told, I said at the beginning that we've got this authority and this authority, and it's pointing towards this, this demon getting pushed out kind of as the lynching point. What's really interesting about that um, isn't so much that he cast out a demon, which we'll see again a couple of times in Mark's gospel, but 
the demon calls out or the possessed or, or whatever unclean spirit, depending upon what your translation says, um, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And what, what that, that evil spirit is trying to do there, the one who names is the one who has the power. Mm -hmm. right? And so if he is going to name who Jesus is, then he's going to usurp Jesus's power. And remember right now in this text, we're seeing a lot about authority. Yeah. And, yeah. and I love that we get this text in the season of epiphany, where we just celebrated the baptism of our Lord, because we're seeing the naming here, here, Jesus can't be named by someone else except by God when he's named as beloved. Yeah. And what does that mean then for us also named beloved, or you want to say we're named Christian little Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the interesting thing in Mark's gospel too, authority really becomes a big, um, a big moving factor in Mark's gospel, but we don't see Jesus as the only one with authority. Yeah. Jesus also passes that authority on to his disciples. And early so, on, I mean, you know, like chapter three, on. By chapter three, he's giving his authority to others. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. It's a little scary. Well, so, but that's a key thing, right? And that's also gets at this difference between power and authority. People in power positions hold on to their power. Because to divide their power is to divide um, their power. <laughs> right. That's all they have. It's all they have. And so they don't want to give it away. But, but an authority model, the more you give away, the more your authority grows. So not only, it's not a zero sum, not only yeah. can it be given to others. It's a multiplier. Um, grown, it's a multiplier. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I like what you're pointing out. Yeah. On the one hand, the, 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 the spirit, the demon is naming Jesus, but it's very clear when Jesus says, come out of the man who has the ultimate authority in that scenario. Yes, yeah. Jesus well, has been named. And but, Jesus but is then what does, what does Jesus say? What is the first thing he says to him? Yeah. Um, does it, uh, isn't it be silent? Um, be quiet. Yeah. Come out of the man. Yeah. So before he even comes out, Jesus is the one who silences, which then of course you have to think, Whenever there, this, the power of the word, right? The word from in the beginning was the word and the word yeah. was with God. We've got the word being Jesus, but the power of word. I, I mean, we could talk and come up with 20 different sermons or yeah. important things for our life based off of these uh, seven, eight verses that we've yeah. got here today. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot in this. Um, I, I hope that I hope that all of those who are hearing this, your people and and my audience will be reflecting on the difference between power and authority. We see it. We see it in our leaders. Um, in people who get the difference between power and authority and people who want us to bow to them because they have um, the power position of an office and those um, who it's clear their sense of leadership is not grounded in their office. It's grounded in their sense of what what their sense of calling is for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. And we see this both in political offices and we see this in, in, in spiritual offices like you and I hold as pastors and in congregations. We see this hit or this miss in our bishops all the time and not just in our denomination, across denominations. Um, mm -hmm. This is the fundamental right. conversation. The whole world was excited for Bishop Michael Curry uh, of the Episcopal Church to preach yeah. at the royal wedding, yeah, um, because yeah. he had authority. He has authority. He has a position of power. They're not mutually exclusive. No, they they sometimes do occupy the same space, um, but it's interesting to watch how people who have authority operate when they are in positions of power. Um, my observation is for people who who have who understand what's at stake. The power does not taint them. Mm -hmm. We have this old joke that, you know, when we strap on collars, I'm picking on Pastor Nicole because she's got a collar oh. on today, that, that when we get ordained and they strap on the collars, it begins to cut off oxygen to our brains, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? uh, which is, 
which is where we see pastors who strap on collars who get really all high and mighty and, uh, and all that type of stuff. The antithesis of the pastor Nicole Eastwoods of the world. Well, I feel um, like I should say I um, we have someone I was afraid I was going to have to make a, a hospital call today. Uh, and we're not making any old hospital calls. And I haven't been with people face to face in how many months? And as the new pastor, I feel it feel like it's a little helpful if you're not feeling well or if you are actively dying or whatever the case. You might be able to figure out who I am if I'm wearing something that that also communicates that. This is not well, my daily and, wear. And my, you know, I do wear a collar up here um, or I used to on Sunday mornings when we're around people. Um, we're in an environment here where people respect uniforms more. Um, mm, so, sure. but in, but I also need to say it's different when a white man has an issue with a collar that in our culture where women still have to fight a fight that white men don't have to fight, the collar is helpful and it keeps doors open and it does keep some respect in place that's necessary still. Um, I never thought, I always made that joke that collars cut off circulation. I never thought I would wear one. Um, and then 2017, when we were commemorating uh, the 500th uh, year since the Reformation, yeah. we had a joint prayer service in Orlando with the uh, Catholic diocese and in the massive Catholic Basilica. And I, of course, I was not ordained at this time. I was just there as a, as a worshiper for this prayer service. And they had a massive procession down the um, aisle, I guess, uh, of, as the beginning of worship. And there were two Lutheran women pastors yeah. uh, that were there. And then, of course, the Catholic Church does not ordain women. And I watched these little girls that were being raised in a faith tradition that didn't ordain women uh, stare. And I realized, oh, I got to wear this thing. Mm -hmm. Like I'm oh. teaching, I, I, my, my very being is communicating something. Yeah. And again, um, to shirk from the responsibility that we have and, or to live as the one, yeah. is to live as a person of authority whether or not we have positions of power. And that's something that actually is for all the baptized. Absolutely. Well, and what I heard you just say is your authority needs to manifest with a collar because of how it communicates possibility and leadership to a whole segment of our population that's been cut off from these things because of their gender. Yeah. And so um, I think that's a really, really powerful witness. So yeah. anyway. I just want everybody to know, I'm not asking Pastor Nicole to apologize for wearing a collar. She <laughs> rocks a collar. She's always rocked a collar. And uh, the, but the reason I love her is because she has an authority that fills the collar. The collar doesn't give her authority. Hmm. Well, I thank you for uh, the ways that you have uh, shaped me and that you're my friend and uh, being open for conversation. Yeah, thanks for inviting me into this today. It's really great. Uh, great share always this. fun. I hope this will be a blessing to both of our folks. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, and that it would help them to live into the authority that they have, that they are not named by the demons or the sins of this world. They are named beloved through their holy baptism. Yeah. They are called and named by Christ uh, yeah. and who actually gives them and us his authority. Thanks be Amen. to God. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. Thanks, friends. Thanks. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.